Us Morning News launched Science in the City in 2018 to get the community local researchers working at the frontiers of their fields. This series is a partnership between the Dallas Morning News, the Center for Brain Health, Southern Methodist University, UT Southwestern Medical Center, the Pro Museum of Nature and Science, and TOXEM. Ordinarily, we'd all be together in person, and I'm so sorry we can't do that this year. But I'm grateful to all our partners for finding innovative ways to bring us all together despite the pandemic. We have two more virtual Science in the City events that I wanted to tell you about. On Thursday, I'll be hosting a discussion with two medical experts about the state of the COVID-19 pandemic in North Texas. And next Saturday, we'll have the chance to meet two SMU physicists to study black holes, dark matter, and other exotic phenomena in the universe. You can register at scienceinthecity.dallasnews.com. I'd like to thank Koshi Dingra and Talk STEM and all of her wonderful panelists for hosting us today and for sharing their work with us. If you enjoyed this series, please consider supporting the Dallas Morning News with a subscription at join.dallasnews.com. You'll have access to our award-winning science coverage, and you'll be the first to hear about events like these. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna, and it is such a pleasure to be here today with everybody. Um, our event today is uh, entitled Art, Medicine, and Potato Chips, Finding Science Everywhere. And we are so pleased to um, invite middle school girls and their parents, friends, teachers, everyone to join us. And the reason is that you really constitute a very important part of the scientific community. I'd love to ask you um, to think about what, what does science mean to you? And please do feel free to use the chat function as we go along. I'll be asking lots of open-ended questions. I'd love to know what people are thinking. Um, you know, what does science mean to you? So, yeah, you probably have had science class, so that's one kind of science. And maybe you have had a great time in science class, so do tell us about that. Maybe you've also had some great science experiences uh, outside, or maybe in the kitchen, or maybe when you're playing sports, or maybe when you're um, painting, maybe when you're listening music, maybe when you're practicing your instrument. I mean, it's endless. So uh, do go ahead and uh, think about what does science mean to you? Next slide, please. Today we have um, seven other fantastic young women and professionals who are gonna share with us their viewpoints on science, and they're all in very different places. And that's kind of part of the point of today's event. That science is absolutely everywhere. Sure, it's in labs and uh, hospitals and doctor's offices, and those are very important spaces. Um, but they are in lots of unexpected places too. So I'm gonna kick it off. The first, we have a three-part event today. The first part is going to be a panel discussion with four highly accomplished women who do science and science and engineering, and I'm using the umbrella term science for STEM. Um, they do it in different ways and in different places. So we're gonna hear from them, and that'll be the first part of the panel discussion. The second part, we're gonna meet three high school girls who have, are gonna lead us all in a design challenge. And the third part, we're all gonna take a virtual walk together in the city of Dallas. And we're gonna look at things around our city through the lens of science and math. So to kick it off, um, I'm gonna ask um, the very first panelist to give us a short introduction of herself, uh, Polly Hollyoke, author and educator. Um, and I'm also gonna ask each panelist in their short introductions to maybe share a little something, a little fact that's surprising about them. Thank you and uh, Polly, please do introduce yourself. Thank you, Koshi. I'm so excited to be here. Um, so by professional background, I was a seventh grade social studies teacher. Um, and the great thing about teaching is you have summers free. And so in the summers, as much as I love my kids, I really didn't want to teach summer school. So I decided I'd just write books. So I wrote fantasy novels and I wrote romance novels. And then I got this idea for a dystopian novel because I was concerned about climate change. I thought, what if I could write a book about kids who are genetically engineered to go live in the ocean because life is so tough for people on land? 
So that was this really wild idea that came into my head. But the problem was I didn't begin to know enough science to be able to write this book because I'd been a history major in college. So I had to learn about marine biology and genetics and climate change. And I did the research, and I guess I did a pretty good job because this book ended up, the Neptune Project is on the Texas Blue Bonnet List, and the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences recommended it as a good science-based read for kids. So slide, please. Um, based on that, I started getting these great speaking engagements. So I went all over the country talking about STEAM issues to older kids and teaching about dolphins and the ocean food chain to younger ones. Slide, please. Next. And then um, I got invitations to go cool places like Hawaii and Florida when my book made state reading list there. And I also got to indulge. I, I love teaching writing in general and getting kids to use their imaginations. So um, that's me teaching kids uh, writing workshops down in the Rio Grande Valley. So I have been so fortunate to have in my professional background these two skills of writing and, and teaching. But the STEM elements in the Neptune books is really what gave them extra staying power. And uh, it's all been a ton of fun. And then my one weird fact about me is the fact I was actually bitten by a rattlesnake. And the fact I was the first aid mom for my Girl Scout troop, I actually knew the exact first aid that you're supposed to do. So I, I, I did the first aid myself, and I'm still here. So that's me. Thank you, Polly. And I'm so glad that worked out well. I had no idea that it happened to you. Um, next in our panel is Dr. Mamta Jain, Infectious Disease Specialist at UT Southwestern Medical Center. Hi, uh, my name is Mumpa Jan. I am um, a professor of internal medicine um, at UT Southwestern, and I specialize in infectious diseases. So the reason that I enjoy what I do in academic medicine is just because of the variety of what I can uh, do. I run, I'm uh, going to show the next slide, I run clinical trials and various therapeutics uh, most recently, I've been running clinical trials in COVID-19, uh, but I've done trials in hepatitis B and C and influenza and HIV. Um, and, 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 and so there's an opportunity to bring novel therapeutics to patients that have diseases, uh, infectious diseases. And, and sometimes they work and sometimes they don't work. But regardless, it improves our knowledge and helps us to um, understand how we can further um, improve science and, and, and uh, um, outcomes for patients. Um, but, but that's not all that I do. Um, I also um, do uh, write grants and implement programs. Um, so the next slide. Um, so before COVID, I, I, I spent a lot of my time in, in the, the world of hepatitis C. Um, and the, uh, the, uh, we have a grant with CPRIT to kind of increase uh, testing for hepatitis C uh, in the state of Texas. And we are doing that in federally qualified health centers in South Texas, and also through a mobile um, unit uh, that goes to rural Texas to provide a point of hep C testing. So this is actually in Tarrant County where we did a health fair and we provide free testing because hepatitis C is a disease now that we can cure, but we can't cure people if they don't know they have it. So you have to first test them and, and, then, um, and then link them to tr treatment. And then this other uh, picture is of me uh, and uh, uh, two of our residents and our, pharma our pharmacy uh, pharmacist who helped um, pull data together on the first like 500 patients that we treated in our viral hepatitis clinic um, with the new curative hepatitis C treatments. And so that's one of the fun parts of, of being in my field is that I get to work with um, residents and, and, um, and, and um, you know, develop new knowledge. Um, and then finally, uh, the next slide, um, I also take care of patients um, in the hospital and uh, in the clinic um, providing care for various infectious diseases. Um, and so um, that's uh, what I enjoy doing. Um, I like the variety. I get to write um, academic papers, and, and I also get to take care of patients. Um, so I was thinking about uh, an, um, 
uh, something different about myself. I, 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 I'll go back to middle school, and um, I, I, I have to say that in middle school, I, I'm not sure that I would have classified myself as a math and science student, but what I really enjoyed doing was reading, and I would always um, uh, like kind of escape to my room to read, but I wasn't reading like the Odyssey or anything like that. I was reading Harlequin Romances. I loved romance stories. <laughs> that was my favorite thing to read. So yeah, I read a lot of gentle novels, but that's what I did. <laughs> Thank you, Mamta. Um, so there you go, you know, a leading researcher in COVID-19, but, you know, Holic and Romances, that's somewhat uh, almost universal. Uh, I know I read my share. Um, next, um, we have Lynn McBee, um, who is a scientist, CEO of Young Women's Preparatory Network, as well as the chair of board for EarthX, and these are just some of the various um, positions that she holds. Thank you for being here, Lynn. Thank you, Koshi. I'm so excited to be here with everyone this morning. I am a scientist. I am, had a degree in biochemistry and was a biochemist for many years, but currently I am the CEO of Young Women's Preparatory Network. We're a network of 10 public all-girls schools across the state of Texas. We're based here in Dallas. Our girls are from underserved populations, most being the first generation to go to college and some being the first generation to graduate from high school. Our schools have a focus on STEM, leadership, and going to college, so things that I'm all very passionate about. I do wear lots of hats. One of my other hats is I am chairman of the board of EarthX, and EarthX is based right here in Dallas, and we are the largest platform for the environmental uh, area. We bring all sides together, the right and the left, Republicans and Democrats, everyone together to work to find sustainable solutions for our future and our environment. We recently launched EarthX TV, which I hope I get to share with you a little bit later, um, but it's a very large platform or an international organization at this point, and um, would love to have, since we know that Generation Z is the one that is most interested in the environment, when we do polls, uh, people that are 25 and under, this is their number one issue. So we're real excited to get the youth that are on the phone involved in, in this work. So um, I wear lots of hats. I'm honored to be here this morning. And I guess um, a strange, maybe just, oh, and I haven't told you to move the slide. So this is me with some of the girls around the state. As I said, we have 10 different schools. The girls in the left are up from our Talkington School in Lubbock. And of course, our school here, some of you might know of it. It's Irma Ron Hell. It's over uh, near Fair Park. And it's um, on US News World Report Best Of. And since we've been founded, 100% of our girls have graduated from high school and 100% have been accepted to college. And we have an amazing amount of scholarship dollars that goes with these really incredible young women. So I don't know, Koshi, if there's another slide, but if there is, you can, yep. And there's just more. That was um, an event we took. Uh, we had the girls at all the different schools write essays uh, on what leadership meant to them. And then when Michelle Obama was in town, she actually did a one-on-one -on -one with the girls that were selected. And these were some of the girls that were selected and they had a one-on-one -on -one that day with her. So really giving these girls from different backgrounds, not privileged backgrounds, the opportunity to uh, learn to really reach their fullest potential. So it's just, it's been really awesome work. Um, and I think that's probably it on the slides. And my one, I don't know if it's a strange fact, it's something I enjoy, which probably will catch most people by surprise. I enjoy deep sea fishing. So I'm, Go out and deep sea fish. <laughs> so there you go. Thank you, Lynn. Um, and again, I'm learning new things about uh, all, all four panelists through this uh, discussion. That's so great. I had no idea you did that. Um, thanks so much. Uh, next, uh, the fourth panelist, uh, last but definitely not the least, Dr. Dipali Palta, is um, a STEMinist. I love that um, noun and also Head of West Europe Research and Development for PepsiCo. Thanks for being here, Dipali. Thank you. Uh, if you go to the next slide. So I'm Dipali, and I'm actually going to start with my weird fact first. So my name is Dipali because I was actually born on Diwali, which is the um, one of the biggest festivals we have in India. So while everybody in my family is named with an S, um, automatically, just in the hospital itself, my name just became Dipali. 
Um, and weirdly, when I actually came to U.S. from India, uh, I am born on Halloween. So I get to celebrate two birthdays uh, and uh, festivals, if you will. So um, as Koshi said, Dipali, um, I am a wife. I am a dog mom. I am a daughter. I'm a sister. I'm a scientist. And I am a feminist. Feminist, if you didn't know, feminist is someone who advocates for attracting both men and women in the areas of STEM, especially girls. So I'm very proud um, to, to do my part to now be a mentor for getting more people in science and technology. Because I got to tell you, in middle school, I hated math. Uh, hopefully, we'll get to talk about that more. Um, but in my job side, I have been with PepsiCo. You may also know uh, it as Frito-Lay. People actually know more our brands than they know the actual company. So Lay's, Gatorade, Tropicana Juice, that's all part of the company I work for. And I have a really cool job because I get to make chips. Um, in addition to making chips, we also get to work on how to help with climate change by thinking about biodegradable and compostable packaging. And if you thought that's all what a scientist or engineer does, well, PepsiCo actually ended up sending me to Africa too to work on clean water. So as a scientist, your possibilities are endless. So if you go to the next slide, I will just leave you with this on my introduction to say, where you see a potato chip, I see a science and curiosity treasure chest. Because it's not just a crispy little thing to get that crispiness. There's quite a lot of science and math involved. So if you're ever curious about how potato chips are so stemmy, just hit me up on LinkedIn and we'll have a chat. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, I know since I've met with Polly, I don't look at potato chips the same way ever. <laughs> it's just uh, part of the wonderful, um, you know, way that she looks at things. Um, and I have to say that thinking about a PhD in engineering, you know, being responsible or at least partially responsible for creating the delicious snacks that we all enjoy, just, you know, made me look at things a little differently. And that's what I hope that this event will do for everybody. So we're now going to... Um, just um, have a quick discussion with our four fabulous panelists. Um, let me ask, uh, <clears throat> let me aim my first question for you, Dipali. Think back to your middle school years. What did you love to do when you weren't at school? You mentioned you didn't love math. Um, what was your relationship with math and science like back then, whether it's in the classroom or out of the classroom? What comes to mind? Just, you know, very quickly. Sure. I think middle school years for me were the years when I don't know, it just felt like I just turned into a rebel. It was, I was asking a lot of whys and a lot of why nots. It didn't stop at home, it didn't stop at school, it just carried with me. Some of them were really good questions like, why is the sky blue? Or what happens when you turn the light switch on? Why does the light bulb suddenly shine? But then there were things that my parents really, really got annoyed with, like, why should I do this? So I think because I said so, stop, stopped holding its gravity in middle school for me. <laughs> it, everything needed to have a reason. Um, as far as my relationship with math and science went, I loved science. I loved looking at plants. I loved looking at animals. I loved looking at uh, just chemistry and physics and all these things. Math, I hated. I scored lowest in math. I mean, I scored better in my languages than I did in um, math. And back in India, scoring good in languages was pretty hard. Um, and as you can tell, I just said scoring good instead of store, scoring well. So my language is not good. So you can tell, yeah, you can tell like how bad I was really in math. Um, I think it took, a, I think it took 11th grade for me to really like math because of my teachers. But really in middle school, it was the, Beginning of the question why, which may have come across as annoying, but really was the seedling for my curiosity leading me into who I am today. Thank you, Dipali. Um, Mamta, um, quick question for you. <clears throat> and by the way, I mean, this is a relatively informal discussion. Please, uh, panelists, you know, uh, do jump in if you would like to add on. Um, but Mamta, a question for you. Why do you think, uh, this is something that came up in a conversation that we had recently, and I know you mentioned something about this. I was curious to have you share a little bit more. 
Why do you think, Mamta, that girls are so well suited to do science and to succeed in the sciences or in STEM or STEAM? Well, you know, I think I think girls and, and women um, are are uh, people that can work in teams, and I think um, today's science is not about individualism, but it's about teamwork. Um, and um, it, it takes a lot of different types of ideas to be able to move the needle in science. And um, uh, I, I just think um, girls and, and women uh, think more collaboratively, than, and, and, and therefore they're just more naturally suited for, for uh, the field of science. I think science requires all the creativity. Um, which I think, um, I mean, I think both boys and girls have that. But, um, uh, you know, I, I, I think, um, I think that it's, to me, it's really about, um, working as a team, building consensus, um, uh, and, and solving problems. Um, and I think there's just something about, um, maybe just, um, um, it seems like, that's what we as girl, a women do is <laughs> just finding the solutions to things and um, whether, you know, it's just at home and figuring out, uh, you know, all the timetables and when to take people to what events and things like that. We just, we're, we're, we're good at doing that. Um, and, uh, so, um, I, you know, and I, I hope that people learn that science is not just about being the laboratory. And it is really, it's just, there's such a diversity um, and, and, and you don't have to love math, um, but you do have to have curiosity, and that's, that's the key. Um, and, and I think then, you, you know, there's just so much that uh, science can bring. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mamta. Um, thanks so much. Lynn, so that's something that, you know, I love to think about and talk about, which is, well, you know, labs and, you know, specialized scientific places are, of course, important because that's where a lot of our expert, you know, trials and work that you're doing, for example, MAMTA happens. But let's think a little bit about how we use our science, STEM, STEAM. I kind of use these terms interchangeably because I'm really asking everyone to look at this broadly. So, Lynn, give an example of how you use your own STEAM mindset in your everyday life. So my, my everyday life, uh, I wear very many hats, as you'll see by the, I was looking at all the different things you had me listed as, and I'm very, you know, civically engaged and give to a lot of organizations and do a lot of things. And so one of the things, and I feel like I'm going to echo a lot of what we just said, is that, um, you know, when you've got a, a STEM mindset, you're, um, you're able to think critically, you're able to, um, you know, you're creative, so you're, you're able to look at things under different lights and, and, and figure out a, the answer to the question. So in my everyday life, I have lots of decisions that have to be made and lots of challenges that I come across. And I'll pull upon that creativity, that critical thinking um, to really get at the best decision for whatever I'm challenged with. I'm also someone that's very uh, determined and resilient, and I think that's a, definitely a, a trait of someone with a, a STEM mindset. And then I'm always looking to find sustainable solutions. You know, it'd be easy just to find a solution to a problem, but if you're really looking at how you find a sustainable solution so you don't have to revisit that problem and you can change a system or a process to make things better as you go. Um, so I pull upon everything in, you know, what I would say, you know, creativity, critical thinking, uh, being resilient, of course, being determined, and, and then just weighing, using all of those uh, uh, skills to really make the right decisions and, and to move agendas and projects and big things forward. So, um, and, and creating things too, you know, being able to put things together. So, um, yeah, I use it every, I use all those skills every day. <laughs> Thank you. And I think, um, you know, that's a good point. I mean, these qualities uh, sort of put this over the ingredients, you know, the building blocks, whatever you want to call it. And so, I mean, I hope that all the, um, Young people and their caregivers listening today, it's, you know, it's, it's something you carry with you. It's a beautiful thing. You know, it's part of the human condition, having this mindset. And you can, like anything else, uh, cultivate it, right? You can, uh, if you're into playing basketball or volleyball or 
playing an instrument uh, or just taking a walk, which you're all going to do later today, um, you can still use your STEAM mindset. So it's just a question of how you think about it. I'd like to ask everyone to continue to think about, you know, what does this thing that we are calling science mean to you? All right, Polly, if you were to, if you could travel in a time capsule um, back to your middle school self, what advice would you have for your younger self? Uh, well, I just, I'd, I'd try to get myself more involved in my studies. I was a happy middle schooler, but I was pretty busy writing courses and hiking and playing field hockey. And um, academics, I thought there were other kids in my class that were smarter than I was. I thought that there were, class, I thought the boys were always had their hands up. Um, and I just didn't think I had that much to offer. And it really took going to a single sex high school to change that mindset for me. Um, so I just say to all you middle school girls out there, you have so much to offer. Please, please do, do speak out and speak up. I also just want to say I came to STEM quite late in my life. You can still find out about science, you know, really more in my 50s. Um, I just really wanted to talk about climate change. And I think fiction can be a great way to get at, at scientific issues or get kids thinking about science. Um, so, yes, you, you don't have to be a scientist in fourth grade or a scientist in eighth grade. You can get science here, at least be involved in the ideas of science, even in your 50s and your 60s. Thank you. And I know that uh, many of the uh, girls listening today probably have, you know, read your book and enjoyed it. And I myself was the middle schooler who loved reading and writing. Um, to me, being a writer was would, would have meant that I would have arrived. So you have arrived. <laughs> I'm still working on it. Um, but yes, I think that it's wonderful to use your own talents wherever you are and to connect to science that way, because often unknown to us all, we are doing science. And hopefully these con this conversation we're all having can help us kind of think back to look at to our everyday lives and think about, oh, you know what, when I was doing that, I guess I was solving a problem and I was, you know, thinking critically and approaching it scientifically. And I don't know, that, that definition, I think, helps us all uh, see ourselves in a different way. And I think that we are all scientists and we see ourselves that way. In addition to other things, the beautiful thing, as Lynn has illustrated for us, you don't have to be just one thing. You can be many, many things. I mean, it's a beautiful um, way to live your life. So, uh, Polly, let me ask you now about your book. Your book, uh, your books, including the uh, Neptune Project, are hugely successful. So, how did you decide to highlight science? You mentioned your interest in climate change. Um, were there any other factors when you decided, as you mentioned, not having a specific science background? How did you come to decide to highlight science in your fiction? And what advice do you have for young writers in the audience? All right. So, uh, actually, I really needed to make money. <laughs> That was also, a, a, I think that's a fair reason to embark on things, on, on projects. But, um, no, I just was so frustrated, having cared a lot about the environment my whole life, and then realizing my own children were not losing, learning about climate change. They weren't getting taught it in school. Um, kids didn't seem to be kind of dialogue about it. It's like, how can I change that? How individually can you make a difference? And so once I came up with the concept for the book, I just went all out in on it. And I'm really glad I did because now people download my teacher guides, you know, and I go to schools and they think they're getting an author and they do get an author, but I have four or five slides in my PowerPoint about the greenhouse effect um, because it's still not really, climate change is not being discussed in those countries. It's not being discussed in the schools. It's not getting the attention I would like to see it have. And so, yeah, I just, I dialed that up in the books and I'm really glad I did. And in fact, the new project I'm working on is a climate disaster book for high schoolers. Um, I want to give teachers in high school a platform to discuss these issues. So fiction can be a way. Look at your gifts. Look at what you can do. If there's something you care about, maybe you can change the world in some little small way. I've got a lot of kids talking about marine biology and um, the oceans and about climate change. And, again, it was through fiction, which is maybe not the way you mostly think about going at something, but it, it worked for me. It's been really rewarding. Oh, and then my advice to writers. I'm sorry, two parts. Keep this one quick. You need to read, read, read. Um, every time you read a book, you're expanding your vocabulary. And words are the building blocks of our stories. So your big job in seventh, eighth, ninth grade is to read if you want to become a writer. You also want to keep a journal. Keep on writing because you get better at stuff when you practice. And then um, my final thing is I always say unplug. And I know even in COVID, I know that your phone and your computer are your, your connection to your friends. 
but I hope every day you at least unplug for half an hour and let your mind drift. You might call it zoning out and spacing out. I call it daydreaming. We do not value daydreaming enough. We've talked about how science can be creative. If you guys don't keep practicing your daydreaming, which is when new ideas pop into your head, we're not going to have new equations or the cure for cancer. Um, so scientists and writers, we all need to daydream. I love that. Thank you so much, Polly. Um, Mamta, you're on the front line battling COVID. Um, it's on all of our minds, obviously. Tell us a little bit. Uh, I know you could probably spend a long time talking about this, but just to give us a sense here, what has life been like for your for you personally and professionally since March of this year? <laughs> oh, so you know, um, I uh, yeah, my life has changed dramatically. Um, you know, I um, volunteered to uh, take on a couple of the co uh, the COVID trials in March. Um, because I, I at that time really had the skill sets to be able to do that. Um, I was an infectious disease doctor. I knew how to do clinical trials, and so I volunteered to do that. Um, thinking that this was like a six-week thing, nine, twelve weeks. Now it's nine months, and we're still going. Um, so. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I've, I've pivoted my entire career from what I used to do into doing COVID, um, and, and it, it does take a toll. But I think what's rewarding um, is that um, uh, in some small way, I, I hope that we are doing something that is helping patients improve. We are definitely in some way, whether this, our trials work or don't work, we are contributing to knowledge. That is very important because to end this pandemic, we have to get better um, science. We have to understand the disease. We have to understand the therapeutics and we have to get better treatments. And that's only going to be done through, you know, doing these types of, of trials. So, um, uh, it, 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 you know, sometimes you're called on to do a lot of work. I mean, I often spend 12 hours a day um, doing work. But um, that's what is required at this time. Thank you for all you're doing, Mamta. I know from on behalf of all of us here today. Um, and thank you for that. Uh, and by the way, I am seeing the chat. Um, I'm so glad that some students are doing uh, having climate change campaigns in the science class. Um, and by the way, there will be a brief Q&A with the panelists in a few minutes. So if you have questions for them, you can ask them directly using the Q&A uh, function. Um, we have a parent who's asking, uh, what should we focus on instilling in our daughter during these middle school years? Wonder if anyone has any thoughts on that on the panel. I think um, just being curious, reading and, and being curious about what you're, um, what you're hearing and really wanting to understand um, not just what's been said, but what's the, the basis for that. I think that critical thinking is what we should really try to be developing. Um, what are the facts? And, and, and learning to be able to make a, a opinion based on facts. Wonderful. And I think that, um, again, you know, every, every child is different, but so much of it is, um, unfortunately, there's this sort of single story for a lot of uh, students and their parents and teachers, meaning the story of science is related to the story that's told to them in the classroom. And that may work for some people, but not everybody. So I think as a parent, what you can also do is open it up. Like every story, there's multiple stories. So maybe the curriculum that year is all about rocks, and maybe your daughter is not that into rocks. Does that mean that it ends there? Um, no, of course not, you know. The beautiful thing about science is you don't have to be an expert, as Mamta said, and as we all are saying, ask questions and try and find out some answers and, um, you know, and kind of convey that, you know, there's a lot you can actually address and answer without a ton of specialized equipment, just through some basic research, some looking around. We're going to kind of model that a little bit when we go on a walk together as well, where we kind of ask and answer questions with nothing but our minds and our, um, our eyes. Um, Lynn, question for you. Your early career started as a biotech researcher. 
you now lead a growing network of public girls schools. Uh, how did you choose this path? And also tell us about EarthX and Earth, EarthX TV. How can middle schoolers get involved? Sure, I'd love to. One thing I wanted to tag on before I answer the question is I think the biggest thing when I think back to my own upbringing, and I think like most of the panelists, we were from a generation where girls didn't do math and science as much. And as a parent, to really encourage that. I was lucky to have a dad that was a mathematician and encouraged it when my sisters played with baby dolls and I was out collecting bugs and building ramps and things. So I think just encouraging, like Koshi said, I think that's a lot. Um, and, to, and to just never let down, if that's if that's what you want to do, just continue to stay curious and continue to do what you love. Because um, it'll have, you can have a very diverse career, which will lead me to answering your question. I was uh, hired by New England Bio Labs. It's a, I was employee 75. It's a now a 500 person company. I did research. I moved to Boston and then they moved me to Dallas for business development. And I, um, cause I think they realized outside of research, I also could communicate and, and understood, um, how to position our company and how we were growing. So went about setting up distributorships and subsidiaries all over the United States for New England Biolabs. And I bet Mott has used some of the products that New England Biolabs uh, carries restriction enzymes, DNA modifying enzymes, went all the way to Latin America. And anyway, did that for about 25 years. And when I was in Dallas, I was also very uh, interested in volunteerism, giving back, being civically engaged, you know, saying yes to things that I, you know, if I was curious about it and someone asked me to, to help, I would say yes. And so a piece of advice to answer when I'm answering this question is to say yes more than you say no, if you're curious about it, because you will have, you just never know where life is going to take you. So I got to know one of the senators that was the champion for the legislation that led to it being legal for there to be single gender public education through some of my volunteer and civic work. And when this position with Young Women's Prep Network came up about eight years ago, she called me and she'd worked with me and she'd seen me chair board meetings and chair campaigns and projects. And she said, you know, I know that you're doing this professionally, but you've got all the skills to run this. And so I um, put my CV in and I was hired. And I went about using my STEM brain to grow the network. The network is now 10 very strong public all girls schools, 5,000 girls in our network. All of our schools are on US News and World Report Best Of. And so really using that STEM, asking the question, working to improve whatever was not, you know, where it needed to be, using all those building blocks that I had in me. And it's been just the most remarkable thing. So I'd say it was kind of a second career and a, a very rewarding career. I also um, am very involved in EarthX. So I'm going to address some of the climate change things that I'm seeing right now. In EarthX, we launched EarthX TV recently. It's a streaming channel. And it's uh, programming uh, that brings, again, like I said, all sides together focusing on, you know, sustainable solutions for our environment. One of the programs that we have is called Climate 911 Youth Reports. And we have got youth climate activists and young scientists that interview politicians and different policymakers because we know that it's a big issue and it's going to take all of us coming together, both sides, it's going to take um, – it's it's going to take policy changes. It won't be done through just people's behavioral patterns. Things will help, like, you know, turning off the water and recycling, but really what's going to help changing things are going to be policy changes. So having these youth climate activists on this Climate 911 Youth Reports, which you'll have to go to earthxtv.org and watch, um, we've got just some really spirited, great conversations with these young uh, young leaders that are interviewing these policymakers and these politicians and asking exactly what they're going to do in these different areas. So I encourage you to, to watch EarthX TV, and we'd love to have all of you involved. When you go on earthx.org, uh, you can look. There's different places. You can be a volunteer. You can join the league. You can be a young, you know, young, young advocate. So we've got lots of things if you, if you go to the website there. But we would love to have all of you all engaged in the conversation around science, sustainability, environmentalism, and climate change. So, thank you. Thank you, Lynn. I, uh, I love the fact that EarthX TV allows young people to actually actively participate. I'm a big believer. I mean, in the, the, the beautiful thing about the world we're living in is um, for young people, unlike when I was in middle school, you can actually directly, you know, be an author and you have authoring tools thanks to technology. Uh, on Talk STEM, similarly, we really love to have young people share their STEM mindset by sharing their photos, sharing their videos, et cetera. So there's a lot you can do as opposed to, you know, 
oh, I don't know, 35, 40 years ago, I'm dating myself when I was in middle school, where really there was, you know, definitely much less open that I could do. All right, the poly. Um, you never expected to work in a food and drink company as an engineer. Um, tell us how you came to choose this very interesting path. Not sure if she can hear you. Dipali, are you there? Hope we didn't lose yeah. her. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, yes, I can you now. Did you hear my question? Yes, I did. Okay, yes, okay, cool. I wasn't sure if we were having a tech list. Yeah, tell us how you came on this very interesting path. It's not, at least before I met you, I never thought about people who had PhDs in engineering working at a food and beverage company. So do tell us. I'm sure I'm not the only one wondering about that. <laughs> no, I was wondering about that too. So I went to Georgia Tech. I did my uh, PhD and master's both from there in material science and engineering. And I was working on how do you make DVDs and CDs much cheaper? How do you store um, information on that in a much cheaper way so an everyday man could do it? So I really thought I was going to go work in Texas Instruments or Intel or places where we t think about silicon wafers because a lot of my work in PhD was wearing that clean room suit where you see people in white overalls and masks and gloves and everything else. I was actually PepsiCo and frito -Lay. They came to our campus recruiting fair, and uh, I was just walking around all the tables. And quite frankly, Koshi, I had the same question for them. They're like, hi, we're PepsiCo. Would you like a snack? And I was like, yes. They're like, are you interested? And I was like, eh. why do you need me? <laughs> It was a question. My life is based on questions, sometimes good and sometimes annoying, uh, but I feel never stupid. Um, it was a very respectful question to say, hey, I'm struggling to see why would you need a PhD to make potato chips? Because you take a potato, you peel it, you, you cut it, and you fry it. I could do that at home. Um, and, and they blew my mind. As you saw the slide I had, oh, my God, how much chemistry and uh, science and mathematics that goes into it. But the simple explanation they gave me at the career fair was to say, look, potato is a natural raw material. It's an agricultural product. Every potato in every climate grows differently. But when you taste a Lay's potato chip, pretty much everywhere nationally you can pick up a potato chip in a Lay's bag and it tastes the same. It has that same crunch. Now that takes engineering because you're taking something that is very different, but you're using science and math Oh my God, frying or baking, there is so much math and science that goes into even baking cookies the same way. Uh, so there's a little bit of art to it, but there's a lot of science and technology to it. It just blew my mind. I'm like, oh God, what a fantastic opportunity to work somewhere where I actually love the product and I can eat the product. And whatever I do, one, everybody has a perspective about it. Like I can't go on a flight because I'm a, I'm a chatty person if you haven't picked up by now. Like, you know, flights and things with random strangers, as soon as I say I work for Frito-Lay or I made the next flavor of Lay's, everybody has an opinion about my job. I love it. It's a conversation starter. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much. Um, so we're going to uh, open it up to uh, any questions uh, if any of the young people or their adults are interested in uh, asking our panelists any questions, uh, you can do so now by using the Q&A function. Um, and while you're thinking about your questions, let me just say, you know, we've got four women here who work um, currently in their current sort of professional careers in a food and beverage company, in a uh, university and a hospital and medicine, in schools, and as an author. Um, and I think ordinarily most people say, well, these four women have very little in common with each other. But I would say they have a ton in common with each other. They're all people who clearly value questions above everything, live their lives by asking questions and coming up with evidence-based responses to those questions. And this is a good habit, regardless of whether you go into a quote-unquote scientific career or not, because I, I think in the 21st century, how we define a scientific career is opening up. There's, but that mindset, that ability to be resilient, to ask those questions, to search for responses that are based on evidence, that's something you will probably use no matter, no matter what job you take, as well as in your personal life. So I do appreciate the four very busy women carving up the time to chat with us all here today. 
Um, and I'm going to see if we have any other questions. Um, or if we don't, huh? I'm not seeing my Q&A button. It seems to have disappeared. Does anyone see the Q&A button? Do we have any questions? There is one. Okay. I think it was, uh... Ah, yes. Questions I see. You see it now, Goshi? I do. Yeah. So, how do you find your jobs interesting? So, maybe, uh, maybe we can have each of the four of you just very quickly tell us, you know, how's your job interesting to you? I think we all agree with you now. Your jobs are important. Uh, but, you know, when you get in the morning and you're just, you know, tired, maybe you didn't sleep well, you know, what is it about your job that really gets you motivated? What do you find interesting? Because you're human, right? Not every single day is the most exciting day in the world. Oh, why don't we start with you? You said me, Koshi? Uh, yes. Uh, yes, oh, Dipali. I am surrounded by food. What's there not to love? It's amazing. <laughs> the other day we were even thinking about what chips could pair best with wine. Oh, my God. That was the best after 5 p.m. meeting we had in a long time. So, yes, I'm surrounded by food. I can taste what I do. So all of that is good. But I got to tell you, the every I've been there for 12 years. My favorite, favorite thing to do now, because I'm not quite doing the engineering and developing chip flavors myself, what I am doing is preparing the next generation of females and males um, and people who are way, way smarter than me. How do I get them in the company and how do I prepare them to be the best leaders they can be? So talent development is what gets me going, well, other than the food, of course. Thanks, Dipali. Anyone else have anything to share about how you find your jobs interesting in response to this question? Yeah, I love um, – it has actually been a wonderful place to go into a story in the middle of COVID. I have a place I can escape in my, in my imagination. But I wake up every morning, and when I'm doing these climate disaster books, I have so much I have to find out. So this one that I'm doing, it's a near future climate disaster book in rural Kansas and Nebraska. I have just been finding out so much about pivot irrigation. You know, those big circles you see when you fly across the United States, those are from pivot irrigation. And I didn't realize that they actually send pesticide out through those arms. They do all sorts of things through those arms. And that just kind of blew my mind the day I studied pivot irrigation. And um, my kids are eco-warriors, so I'm finding out a lot about pumping stations and natural gas. And I'm loving the research. I'm finding out all sorts of cool things about wind turbine and wind energy. The people who climb those towers, they're crazy. They usually, they, a lot of them are climbers because to surface them, they've got to be comfortable being, you know, 300 feet above the ground. So I know every day when I go to work, I'm going to find out something new, and that's wonderful. Thank you so much um, for that. Does anyone else have anything that they'd like to add? I'll, I'll go. I, uh, I wake up and I have the real privilege of, of working this organization that when I wake up in the morning, it's always going to be diverse and challenging. You never know what's coming. So that's, you know, kind of exciting. But I always think about the end goal and the girls that we're serving in our network. Our girls are coming with not the resources, not the background, not the family support that most of us have uh, had. And to watch and to really be part of taking these girls, our, our schools are 6th through 12th grade, and seeing them in 6th grade be shy, be insecure, come with a million different challenges, and then by the time it, they're graduating in 12th grade, they're strong, they're empowered, they're going to college, they've got full scholarships to really fantastic places across the, the United States. Um, it's it's life-changing work, and it's, it's just... Um, it's amazing. So I get up thinking about them and what do I have to do to keep things strong so that, that they're the best they can be and that we're supporting them in the way they need to be supported. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going um, oh, yeah, no, to, to add. I was going to say, I think for me, yes, it's, um, it's about uh, relationships and, and I, I enjoy, I love going to work. Uh, I have a great team of, of people that work with me. And um, and um, I'm building relationships not just within my you know little UT Southwestern, but it's also outside of because we're uh, collaborating with uh, teams all around the nation and the world. And, and and so I think it's building those relationships and learn get, you know meeting new people virtually. Um, that's that's exciting, and I think that's what keeps things um, interesting and, and for me. 
Thank you all so very much. Um, appreciate your time again, uh, this wonderful panel. I hope everybody uh, enjoyed hearing from them. Um, we're now going to move on to a second segment of today's program. Um, and I'm going to introduce a group of wonderful high school seniors um, who call themselves Girls Do Steam. Um, and I'm going to ask uh, the project lead, whose name is Sonia, to kick it off. Are you there, Sonia? Not sure if they can hear, but um, let us know if you can hear this, Sonia. I think Sonia just got disconnected, so I'll just go ahead oh, no. okay. and introduce, um, introduce us. So uh, we are the Girls Do Steam team, and we are all high school seniors at Green Hill School in Addison, Texas. And we created the Girls Do Steam Journal for elementary and middle school girls with 50 fun science, tech, engineering, art, math, steam activities that involve things like music, sports, nature, you name it. So uh, today we are going to be doing an activity from the journal that um, hopefully when our founder Sonia gets reconnected, she will talk about. But um, for now, I will just do introductions. So as I mentioned, my name is Anaga Guru, and I am a senior at Green Hill with Sonia and Sarah, and the community outreach director for the Girls Do Steam Journal. And in addition to Girls Do Steam, I like to play the French horn, read the news, and go on long bike rides. And I'll hand it back over to Sonia to um, do her introduction. Hi, guys. Sorry about that. That was a little annoying. I could hear everybody, but I couldn't turn on my camera for some reason. Um, but yeah, as Anika said, we're the Girls Do Steam team. But outside of creating the journal, I really like to um, read and cook and do photography. And yeah, so I'm really excited to be with you all today, and I'm excited to do the design challenge from the journal. Now I'll pass it on to our illustrator, Sarah. Hi, I'm Sarah, and as Anika said, I'm a senior at Green Hill with Sonia and Anika. And I'm the illustrator for the Girls Do Steam Journal. And besides working on this journal, I like to write for the newspaper, play volleyball, and I also really like to paint. So I think now Sonia is going to talk about our activity that we're doing today. All right. Uh, can we move to the next slide, please? OK, so today we're going to do a fun design thinking challenge which basically means you're going to be doing a little bit of problem solving and building a quick prototype. So I hope you have your materials with you, which should be two sheets of paper, um, some thick books like textbooks or cookbooks to create a platform, and some paper clips or binder clips, but you can use whatever you have with you if you need to substitute. Um, so today your challenge is to build the longest bridge you can using two sheets of paper, you can make your bridge between two stacks of books, add binder clips or paper clips to your bridge until it collapses. So on the slide, we have the actual page from the journal and the prompt. So you'll have about seven to eight minutes to give this a try. And remember, it doesn't have to be perfect. And while this is going on, Sarah is going to be doing it live, and Anika and I will be asking some questions. And please feel free to use the chat and Q&A function anytime you need. So. Um, let's get started. Ready, set, go. Okay, so hopefully you can see me. I have my little textbook set up here to create like kind of the bridge in between. Um, they're about a foot apart and I have my two sheets of paper here and I'm going to start folding them and hopefully you guys are building along. So Sarah, what's your what's your thought process for building your bridge? Yeah, so I think I'm gonna do kind of like a fan fold. So I'm folding it kind of back and forth like this. So it kind of makes little dips in the bridge.
Yeah, so Sarah, I'm really noticing this sample here and I like it. So why are you deciding to fold it that way? Yeah, I think that the folds will like add more structure to the bridge and kind of interlock the two sheets of paper when I kind of stack them on top of each other. And as you can see, there are little rectangles like this, but then when I pull it apart, it kind of forms triangles. Hopefully you can see that. Hmm. So why are you doing triangles? Um, I just heard that triangles are kind of the most sturdy shape to create a really strong structure. So I think that using triangles in this bridge will be really effective. Wait, no way. I can't believe I didn't think about that. You know, the bridges that I see all over, like the Golden Gate Bridge, they're all based on triangles, and there's a reason why they're really strong. I can't believe I didn't think of that. You know, when I made my bridge, I just made this rectangle folded together with construction paper. But, you know, that's a really cool idea, Sarah. Thank you. And hopefully you can see this is one sheet of paper done. You can kind of see the triangle shapes. I'm going to go ahead and fold the second sheet of paper. Yeah, I agree with Anika. I didn't think of using triangles either and actually did something kind of similar where I folded two sheets of paper. But since I used the regular printer paper instead of construction paper, my bridge actually sags a lot and doesn't hold that many paper clips, so not very sturdy on my part. Um, the people at home doing this activity along with us, we want to hear from you. So please feel free to use the Q&A and chat function if you want to share your ideas, what you're doing, what you're thinking, or even if you're lost, please just feel free to contact us now. Let me just jump in and ask you, this is great. Uh, I know that uh, I just asked in the chat if any, I was curious if any of the people doing this with you now have done this before, maybe a modified version of this kind of bridge building. If so, let us know how it worked for you previously and uh, you know, maybe use different materials. Uh, let us know about that. Yeah, I actually have my two sheets of paper folded and then they're going to kind of stack on top of each other like this. Oh, I see a question in the chat. Where do you put your bridge? Okay, so I have like my two stacks of textbooks here. Hopefully you can see that they're about a foot apart. And then I have my two sheets of paper and then I'm going to interlock them and kind of form a bridge in between these two stacks of textbooks. So you can just kind of make your own little uh, stacks of textbooks, whatever you have around the house. And you can just build your own design using two sheets of paper and just see how it holds up. Okay, so I'm going to start adding things to my bridge to see how many objects it can hold. Let me change angles here. Hopefully you can see that. Okay, so there's my little paper bridge. And I have a box of paper clips here. It's about 100 paper clips. And I'm going to start adding to see how many it can hold up. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10, 11, 12, 13. It's holding a lot so far. 13, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. Okay, I'm just going to start going by handfuls here. This is about 5, so that's about 20. 30. It's holding a lot. 35. Okay, let's just put this entire box on here. It's still holding up pretty well. And if anyone wants to try my design at home, you can see just how sturdy the structure is. It's holding up really well. Let's see, okay, I ran out of all the paper clips. It's all empty. 
let's try adding like some heavier stuff. I have like erasers. Still going. Oh my gosh. That's a strong bridge, Sarah. It's very yeah. strong. Stronger than mine, that's for sure. Do you know how many yours held up, Anika? Yeah, mine only held up about 67 paper clips, so not nearly as strong as <laughs> the triangles that you have. What about yours, Sonia? Mine only ended up holding around 30, so definitely yours is a lot strong. And mine's already kind of sagging in the middle, so definitely not as sturdy, but a bit longer. Um, for those of you at home, I don't know if you're done yet, but how many paper clips can yours hold up? I'm still adding. So it seems like the triangles are the winner, but yeah, definitely let us know. And by the way, if you do this later or if you try it out with different materials, uh, you can always share using social media on TalkSTEM and tell us how yours uh, went. Oh, we have somebody who's, okay, her bridge held up 41. I'm going to put in the chat what, what your bridge design looks like so we can visualize it. Um, and uh, it's amazing how with two simple sheets of paper you can do so much. I would not have guessed, Sarah, that you would have been able to hold that many, that much weight, honestly. Yeah, it's a lot. I'm adding more pencils, <laughs> still holding up. It's okay. still going. Yeah. Um, well, all right, girls, thanks so much. Uh, I, did you want to say anything else about your activity or the bridges or anything you want everyone who's watching to know about this activity or, or the Girls Do scheme? Yeah, actually, we have another slide here. Um, so I hope you all enjoyed our design thinking challenge today. I know I definitely did my design. My final product here could hold over 100 paper clips and some erasers, pencils. And on our screen here, we have some other designs, design example using um, both printer paper and newspaper on the right. Yeah, and I see in the chat that some people held up 41. Um, someone used binder clips and got a big one and a small one. And someone said the printer paper actually worked better, probably because it has less of a bending stiffness. So if you're, you're able to manipulate it a bit more, into more sturdy structures. Um, and then mine, actually, I can see if I can show you guys. So can, you, can, you, can you explain what you mean by that uh, to respond to Evelyn, who asked why it is that the printer paper worked better for her than construction paper? Why do you think that is? And it's all right not to know, but can we guess as to why it is that the printer paper worked better? Well, I think it's because, well, it depends on the shape you're using, but if you're trying to roll up or fold printer paper, it's much easier than construction paper due to the fact that it has less of a bending stiffness. So it's easier to create sturdy structures such as triangles out of it. However, when Anika and I used a similar design and she used construction paper and I used printer paper, because printer paper is less sturdy, it tends to stag more. So I think it really depends. Um, and I have so my it depends design. on, yeah. sorry, but so it depends on, well, I guess it's all kinds of construction paper also, and then your specific design. So it sounds like the two right. key factors are how bendable it is. Is there anything else and that people should think about? Shape and bending, bending stiffness are the two main ones we're addressing here today. Um, and then, Anika, do you have your design? Yes, yeah, so here is my design. I folded like two pieces of like cardstock construction paper. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, I used a rectangular design. And um, like it was a longer bridge, but it wasn't as sturdy. So as you can see, Sonia, Sarah, and I all took pretty different approaches to the challenge. And even though we were using very similar materials to each other, we came out with pretty different results. And uh, now I want to hear from you. I've seen a few things in the chat that some people use like triangles, just like Sarah, and it held up pretty strong. Um, what, what were other people's design processes like? So yeah, let us know in the chat or the Q&A function. Absolutely, we're gonna have to move on. So um, I hope you all enjoyed it. And definitely you can, um, you can reach us on, you can share your photos of your designs on Instagram, uh, at TalkingSTEM, and I know Sonia, Sarah, and Anaga would love to see 
Um, you can also contact them. Go, uh, here you go, girlsdosteam.com, and they have their email. So if you want to talk to them some more about this design channel challenge, you can reach them that way. Girls, thank you so much. Uh, this was really fun. Uh, and, you know, it's amazing how much uh, science and engineering you can do with something as simple as a few pieces of paper and paper clips. So thank you so much uh, for that. Uh, we are now going to move on to our final. We have about nine minutes left, so we're going to take a very short walk. Um, I'm probably just going to get you started, uh, and I, there's ways that you guys can continue the walk because we will be sharing the, um, the content via some YouTube videos that TalkSTEM has created. Um, so, next slide. Here we go. So one of the things that my nonprofit TalkSEM does is we love taking walks. So we like to talk and we like to walk. So it would be fun to just take a little walk together. Um, those of you here can continue. Uh, the weather outside is beautiful. We have about 20 different walks in the city of Dallas. And if you go to our YouTube channel, you can access all of them and we will guide you to take a look at different spaces in Dallas through the lens of math and science. So here we are, here's a fun map of the Dallas Arts District. This is actually created by an artist whom I work with in Vancouver, and she does a lot of um, uh, map creation. So we're gonna, where the pink arrow is, we're gonna take a stroll down Flora Street. Some of you may be familiar with this area in Dallas. It is one square mile of um, architectural treasures in the city of Dallas. I think it's one square mile nationally with the greatest density of architectural treasures in terms of award-winning architectural buildings um, in, in a single city. So we're going to walk, uh, you may know uh, number seven on the map. You may have walked down there. You will have seen this big Pegasus statue at Booker T. Washington High School. So if you're walking down there, there's some very beautiful, fancy buildings, but there are also some very you know, average looking things that maybe you would overlook. So next slide, please. We're going to just watch a minute long video about something very simple that you may have come across. Um, and I want you to first of all think, uh, what is it that you think I think we're having some tech issues, uh, but since we only have about five minutes, um, maybe I can just tell you about these videos, and I hope that you will watch them later, since um, I've selected a few to share with you today. And we had such great conversation earlier, I just didn't want to cut that off. This is content that you can access um, freely on YouTube. Um, next slide, please. I'm just going to tell you about the walk stem stops in the Dallas Arts District, and I hope that you will watch the videos, or even better, go take a walk on your own uh, or with your family later on. So as I said, uh, think about a traffic bullet. Well, I mean, part of my goal today is to have you guys look at anything and everything and ask yourself, where's the science, where's the math? In this next video, also, if you continue walking down um, Flora Street, um, you'll see this beautiful um, uh, church, um, and there's a lot of circles uh, in it. The gentleman, by the way, in these videos is somebody that I collaborate with. He's the founder of the only mathematics museum in the United States. Uh, I don't know if anyone here has been there, but it's called MoMath, and it's sometimes called the National Museum of Mathematics. This is Dr. Glenn Whitney, and he and I co-developed this method of taking a walk and stopping along the way uh, figuring out a question we wanted to ask and seeing if we can answer that question about just anything in the real world. So that's really what all of our walking tours are about, kind of a math, science, STEM, STEAM um, kind of look at everyday spaces. Uh, it's a lot of fun, and it's something that you can also create on your own. So in this, we um, look at there's a lot of circles in here. Why, you know, why are there so many circles in this particular architectural design? Next slide, please. Well, uh, where we're taking a walk is very sort of urban, lots of buildings, but, you know, I am a biologist by background, so of course I had to find something green to look at. Uh, and so we just looked at a grass planting on the side of one of the buildings, also on Flora Street, and asked, well, what's mathematical about grass? Um, and by the way, working with Glenn really made me see math in a whole different way. 
Um, you know, I uh, liked Nepali in middle school and actually in high school. It continued for a while. Math was my least favorite subject and was also the area that I did horribly in, in terms of test scores. Uh, really, it's now working with Glenn that I see that math is way bigger than I thought math was back where I defined it as a very narrow thing that I did in class. Um, and now it's a lot more fun for me. Uh, maybe I don't do super well in math tests, but I certainly do think mathematically about a lot of things in my life. Next slide, please. So then uh, we're continuing to walk down Flora Street and we are at, you may have taken this walk on your own before, we're at the Myerson Symphony Center, place of beautiful music. Next slide, please. And if you've looked at that building, you'll see it's actually, uh, the architect was I am Pei. It's kind of a really interesting, unusual, unique structure. And the question we asked at this stop, and of course you could have asked any infinite number of questions, but the question we picked at this stop was, how do the particular shapes, which is a lot of rectangles, squares and circles together, how do these shapes together make us feel as we are walking by? So it really does elicit a strong reaction, at least we felt we did. So do watch the video and you'll get our take on it. Next slide, please. Uh, here we continued our walk down Flora Street and we um, came upon a lovely bamboo stand right at the entry of the Nash Sculpture Center. Um, and again, we I think the only instruments we had was some string and a uh, ruler, and we asked a question uh, about the bamboo. We were wondering if there was a relationship between circumference and the distance between, uh, the, the distance or the length of each segment of the bamboo. Um, so something you may have learned about in class, about you know linear relationships and other kinds of mathematical relationships. We were wondering about, is there a relationship between circumference and length of segment? So again, do watch that. It's, I think it's about a one and a half minute video. Next slide, please. And then we ended up at the end of our little stroll here at the DMA, the Dallas Museum of Art. Um, next slide, please. And over there, if you've been there, there's this lovely um, mosaic, very large one called Genesis outside of the front doors. And we look at color. I mean, I love a lot of art that's very colorful. And we ask ourselves about, well, what's mathematical about color? And, uh, and how did this artist, uh, who didn't actually use paint, but he used mosaic pieces, how was he able to create this feeling of, in certain parts of the mural, you have the feeling of high contrast, and in other parts you have kind of fading or lower contrast. Given that he wasn't using paint, how was he able to do that? And again, to answer that question, you'll need to watch the video. And then I hope you will go and come up with your own questions. So that's it for our um, presentation today. Again, um, you can finish the tour on our YouTube channel. Uh, just click on the video category, Walk STEM Academy, click on Dallas Arts District, and you'll see those plus uh, a good number more. It's a great way now that the weather is fabulous for you to kind of um, parents and caregivers, uh, as well as kids, just go out there, take a walk, see the questions we came up with, and then tell us some of your own questions about these and other stops. We always love to hear from you. You can use our um, social media handles to connect with us. It's been fantastic uh, being here with everybody today. Thank you to Dallas Morning News for hosting and for organizing Science in the City. We're always delighted to be a part of Science in the City. Keep thinking scientifically. You are all scientists. We are all scientists. Keep those questions going and share them with us, please. Thanks and have a wonderful day.